Uh, good morning, brothers and sisters. I hope you had a, a good uh, weekend. It was enjoyable for me being back at First Baptist and preaching this Sunday after being out of the pulpit for two weeks. And uh, looking forward to spending this week with you uh, doing these uh, devotions. We are starting the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. So you go ahead and be opening your Bible to the book of Daniel, chapter 1, and hopefully you've already read the first chapter of Daniel. And I want to give you a little bit of a, a, a background to help you understand Daniel because in recent days, you know, we've read uh, Jonah and then uh, Obadiah. Now we're in Daniel, these uh, prophets in the Old Testament. And again, I'm, I'm just so you'll know, I'm keeping up with my cranberry juice because I don't want another kidney stone, just so I'm, I'm, I'm being consistent, okay? Just want you to know that. All right, now here's the background. Um, after the death of King Solomon, the nation of Israel experienced their own civil war and divided into two countries. Okay, you had the northern country, the northern kingdom, um, normally referred to after that in the Bible as either Israel or Samaria, and its capital was in the city of Samaria. So there was the city of Samaria in the country of Samaria or Israel, the northern kingdom, the northern nation. The southern nation, uh, the southern country had Jerusalem as its capital, and it's usually referred to in the Bible after this as Judah. Um, on the world scene, Assyria was a major empire that uh, in, in 722 conquered and destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel or Samaria. Jonah was a prophet in the northern kingdom about 30 years before Syr Assyria destroyed uh, the northern kingdom. And, uh, and he's mentioned, as you'll remember, in 2 Kings as well as his own book of Jonah. Um, after the northern kingdom was destroyed, um, in the south you had different prophets, the kingdom of Judah. And as time passed, a new empire named Babylon defeated Assyria, and it became the world's most dominant uh, military force, if you will. And in 605 B.C., so a little over a century after the northern country ceased to be, um, Babylon defeated Assyria, uh, defeated Egypt, rather, and at that point, the southern kingdom, the southern nation of Judah became a vassal state subjected to Babylon. For those of you who are my age, you'll remember back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and into the 80s, uh, before the Soviet Union collapsed, you had the Czech Republic and all these other countries that were part of the Soviet Empire, and they were really subjected to the Soviets. So, Bab so Babylon subjected Judah, and they had to pay tribute or taxes. And in 605, when they became a vassal state, they carried as slaves to, to Babylon a few of the leading citizens, including a young man named Daniel. And Daniel would spend the rest of his life in Babylon. After uh, a few years, about 598 or so, the king of Judah decided he was no longer going to pay taxes to Babylon. And so Babylon and their king, Nebuchadnezzar, attacked and defeated Jerusalem and uh, raided the palace and so on and carried some more people, some more leading citizens away as slaves. And among that group was a young priest named Ezekiel who in Babylon would become a prophet, and we have his book of Ezekiel. So Ezekiel and Daniel are living and serving together at the same time, but in Babylon, and neither of them would ever see Jerusalem or Judah, their home country, again. Well, after about 10 years, the puppet king of Judah rebelled against Babylon, and Nebuchadnezzar brought his army back, and in 587, destroyed Judah, destroyed Jerusalem, burned it to the ground, burned the temple, destroyed the city walls, and carried away many, many more citizens as slaves. During all of that time when Daniel and Ezekiel are in Babylon, in Judah and Jerusalem is another prophet named Jeremiah. So here's the picture. Jeremiah Ezekiel and Daniel are all preaching and serving at the same time. Jeremiah is living and doing it in Judah, in Jerusalem, while Daniel and Ezekiel do it uh, really as slaves in Babylon. 
So that's the, the setting. So Daniel's story begins with that second invasion when they carry him and others away as slaves. And there's some other Hebrew uh, young men in verse 6 you know, that are mentioned that are taken back uh, to Babylon with Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And we know them by their Babylonian names that were given to them later, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, and they're being trained to be servants to, to the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, because they were smart. And he, and he would take some of the leading uh, young men of these nations he conquered and turn them into advisors, trained them in, in Babylonian culture, Babylonian arts, Babylonian literature, Babylonian science, all of that. And uh, Daniel would spend the rest of his life being a good servant to the kings of Babylon, but in the process, he remained godly and never compromised his faith in the God of Israel, the true God who created the universe. And the first test comes when you know the king is, is having all of these young men that are being trained to serve him eat his food and drink his wine, food that quite often would have been sacrificed or offered to their gods first, etc., and Daniel refuses. And so we pick the story up in verse 8. Because to me, Daniel is an example of how to remain godly, how to remain faithful to your God while living in tyranny, while living as a subject of another king. Or for us today, how to be godly while living in an ungodly country. And so in verse 8, Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. And so he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. And if you've read the story, you know the details. I won't go into all of it. But one of the things that stand out to, stands out to me is Daniel was determined that he was going to do what God wanted him to do. Now, he wasn't belligerent. He asked permission to do it. Um, and initially, the permission is not granted. So, so he says, well, well, give me a trial period. And they agree. And the trial period goes well, and so Daniel is able to stay true to his religion. He doesn't, at least in this instance, have to pay a price for it. Um, and Daniel would spend decades serving the king. But here, here's the takeaway for me in the first chapter of Daniel is, yes, we need to be committed to God and determined to, 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 to do what God wants us to do and not do something the culture is asking us to do that we consider that God tells us is sinful. But as we resist the culture and we live godly, we also need to do it like Daniel. Not with arrogance, not combatively, just, Daniel just ask. Um, you'll find later that when they would not, and you know other stories, when they would not let Daniel do what he knew was right, he was willing to suffer the consequences. But none of this was Daniel belligerent. And I think there's a lesson there for us in modern America as our nation becomes more and more sinful, more and more hostile to Christianity, is we can stay true to Jesus Christ, um, but we have to be willing to pay the price if we're not, if, if, if the world says no, we don't like that, without becoming angry and belligerent because then our witness is destroyed. Daniel was faithful and he was, willing to, he was willing to pay the price, but he, he showed respect as well. So how can you and I make Rock Hill a better place to live? How can we make South Carolina a better place to live? How can we be a blessing to our nation and make it a better place to live? While, while being faithful to Jesus, willing to pay the price if the world doesn't like it, but not being mad or angry about it. That's the takeaway for, for me from Daniel, is you don't have to be mad when the world hates you. That's the word for today. I'll see you tomorrow.